Well, what are you all sitting down for? <laughs> We're going to receive the word. So get your Bibles. If you have the ability, get to your feet. Let's honor the Lord today. And let's invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher and be our guide. Father, we thank you today for what you've already done in this church service. And we celebrate your works, God. All the praise, all the glory, all the honor goes to you. And Lord, we thank you that we are your humble servants this day, God. Lord, today as we open your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Open our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives, Lord. May it be fruit that remains, God. We thank you, Lord, today that we didn't come to hear from a man, didn't come to hear from a woman, didn't come to hear from a tall man, short man, black man, white man, brown man. Oh, no, Lord, we didn't come to hear from the ideas and the philosophies of men. Lord, we came to hear from you. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher of the church. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. Lord, we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, Lord. We would also ask it for all of our brothers and sisters, both here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, we would ask that you bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Lord, we bless Calvary Chapel and Harvest, Oak Valley, the Way, Ecclesia, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, God, all the great churches that are out there, the four square denominations, the assemblies of God. Lord, our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. God, if they're preaching your gospel, lifting up your name, we bless them as you would bless us. Also, Lord, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. We ask that you comfort them, protect them, bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, guard them, guide them, direct them, Lord. Lord, may they endure to the end to the glory of God. Deliver them, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. amen. Today, get your Bibles out and go with me to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, once again. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. I didn't realize, but uh, we're going to continue in our series called Running the Race. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, has just been rich verse number one and verse number two, and today we're going to launch into verse number three and verse number four. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we've already read that we're to run our race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, that we're to lay aside weights and sins and snares that, that hold us back. And now, with this thought in mind, verse number three comes along and it says this, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. If you've ever been to a sporting event, you'll know that uh, at times that in those sporting events, people can get weary and, and even grow faint. That word discouraged really means that they could pass out on the way. Maybe you've been outside, it's been a hot day, very arid, not a lot of moisture, not a lot of water, and you see somebody running, and next thing you know, all of a sudden there's a group gathered around them, they're waving at them, trying to cool them down, dump them water on them, trying to get them hydrated. Why? Because they grew weary. And they fainted from exhaustion, maybe heat stroke or sunstroke, that sort of a thing. And that's really what it's talking about, that in this run, in this race, that there's going to be factors that come against our lives along the path. As we're following Jesus, as we're running the race that's marked out for us, there will be things that will tire us. There will be things that oppose us. We're going to grow weary, and at times it can be discouraging. At times that we can grow faint, if you will. And we need to watch that. And the way that we do that is we consider him. Verse number four comes along and it says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. In other words, you haven't given the ultimate sacrifice yet. Yes, they had been persecuted. Yes, they had gone through a lot of trials. In fact, they had their goods plundered. You remember that from Hebrews, the 10th chapter. They actually had things taken away from them, worldly goods, and yet they rejoiced and they were, uh, you know, arm in arm with those who were in prison. They, they weren't ashamed to be called their brother and be associated with those who were persecuted as well. But he says, you haven't yet given the ultimate sacrifice. You haven't yet resisted to bloodshed as some have. And so if we're going to run this race of life, we need to consider him. We need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and not only just fix our eyes on Jesus, but really to understand what's going on. That word consider, if you look it up in the original language, really talks about analyzing, adding up all the data, really pouring over something in order to come to a conclusion about it. So he's saying, I want you to take a look at Jesus. I want you to analyze all the data. I want you to look at the facts about him. I want you to add up all the stuff that you know about Jesus. And as you do that, as you look at his 
life, as you look at Jesus, now all of a sudden you can add up the facts and it will help you to not grow weary and it will help you to not grow faint, that you will not pass out on the road, but that you'll be able to run. It's almost like a a cup of water with electrolytes in it that somebody hands you on the race. That way you're not going to get discouraged and you're not going to grow weary, but you'll be able to run the race with endurance like he's called us to. Paul Harvey was a very famous reporter. Many of you remember his columns and remember his radio shows. And he reported that one summer morning, as a man by the name of Ray Blankenship was preparing his breakfast, he gazed out the window and saw a small girl being swept away in the drainage ditch besides his house in Andover, Ohio. Blankenship knew that farther downstream, the ditch disappeared with a roar underneath the road and then emptied into the main culvert. Ray dashed out the door and raced along the ditch, trying to get ahead of the floundering child, and then he hurled himself into the deep, churning water. Blankenship surfaced and was able to grab the child's arm, and they tumbled end over end. And with about three feet of that drainage ditch going down, he felt something hard on his hand, and he grabbed a hold of it. Maybe it was a rock or something like that. And he held on, and he held on to that girl as the waves beat against him and pushed against him and strained against him until help could arrive. The fire department came, and they pulled him out. They treated both Ray and the little girl for shock there on the side of that ditch. And it's amazing because Ray was actually recognized by the U.S. Coast Guard and given the Silver Life Saving Medal. That's a medal that's not given to civilians. That's something that is given to the Coast Guard. And yet, this medal was fitting for Ray because he was selfless. And he was at even greater risk to himself than most people knew. The reason why is because Ray Blankenship can't swim. He had one focus. He had one thought. He considered, he added up the facts that this little girl's going to die unless I do something. And at his own peril, he didn't consider the fact that he couldn't swim. He didn't consider the fear. He didn't consider that they both could go down and they both could die. All he considered was that little girl needs saving and I'm here and I'm able to do something about it. And he went and he jumped in and he saved that little girl's life. In the same way for all of us, there are things in life that will come against us, fear that will try and surround us. There's going to be limitations that the world tries to put on us. You can't do that. You don't have the strength. You don't have the ability. You don't have the knowledge. You don't have the wisdom. And life will beat against us. There will be opposition and resistance that comes against each and every one of us in our lives. And yet we are not to consider all of the insufficiencies and the things in our life that would come against us. Otherwise, we will grow weary and get discouraged and maybe even faint on the road. No, we are to consider him. We are to look at Jesus. We are to add up all the facts about him. And as we do, that will give us the strength that we need. That will give us the ability to endure. And that will help us to win the battles of life and to stay strong on the race that God has called us to. We are to consider him. First thing that we're going to consider about Jesus is we need to consider his life. We need to consider the life of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came and he lived on the earth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 3 in the J.B. Phillips paraphrase says this. Think constantly of him, enduring all that sinful men could say against him, and you will not lose your purpose or your courage. When you think about the life of Jesus, think about the fact that from the moment he came on the planet, at his very birth, that there was opposition that came against him. I mean, this is a little baby, born in a manger, born in an insignificant place to insignificant people. These were Jews. These were Nazarenes. Now, here at Bethlehem, the city of David, not the palace, not the place of kings. And yet, from the very moment that he was born, Herod was out trying to kill him. There was persecution that came against him. Joseph had to go down to Egypt and waited until Herod died so that he could come back. Jesus personal ministry started right when John the Baptist baptizes him in the Jordan. He comes up out of the water. There's a great victory. The Spirit of God is descending on him like a dove. There, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness for what? For glory? For joy? For for connecting with the Father? No, so that the devil could tempt him. Forty days and forty nights, he's out there, and the devil's coming against him. The devil is tempting him, and he overcomes. Jesus starts his ministry, he starts preaching, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He starts to tell them the good news of the kingdom. Those of his own house are going, wait a second, who is this guy? What does he think he is? This, isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we know his mother Mary? Didn't he build the table that's in my house? I mean, he was a carpenter. What's going on with that? Who's this guy think he is? At one point, they got so frustrated with him, they'd drag him up the side of a hill and were ready to throw him over the edge in order to kill him. 
Jesus comes and he speaks and he has the religious leaders against him. The Pharisees are coming against him. The Sadducees are coming against him. The scribes are coming against him. The lawyers are coming after him. All of the people are in an uproar. At one point when Jesus starts declaring who he is, rather than say, thank you God for coming in the form of your son and raising up their hands in worship, what do they do? They pick up stones to throw at him and kill him. They're plotting his death. They're speaking behind his back. There's intrigue. There's innuendo. There's things going on behind the scenes. All of the leadership is plotting how they might kill Jesus and take him out of the scene. See, when you consider Jesus' life and you add up all the facts about him, you realize, you know what? Jesus endured a lot of stuff on the earth. How much more should I endure for him? If he can go through all that opposition, if he can go through that with strength and with grace and with joy, then that same Jesus is now the one that's living on the inside of me. And if they spoke that way about Jesus, it doesn't matter if they speak that way about me because he's my master, he's my Lord, and I'm following his footsteps. In AD 381, Gregory of Nazianzus wrote about Jesus. He began his ministry by being hungry, yet he is the bread of life. Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he is the living water. Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. Jesus paid tribute, yet he is the king. Jesus was accused of having a demon, yet he cast out demons. Jesus wept, and yet he's the one who wipes away all of our tears. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. Jesus was brought as a lamb for slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. Jesus died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. We need to consider Jesus' life. See, when we consider the life of Jesus, we realize that it doesn't matter if the world hates us as long as Jesus loves us. Oh, come on, somebody. Think about that. Consider his life. Consider him. If you know that the world hates you, it doesn't matter if the world hates you as long as Jesus loves you. See, when you start to consider the life that Jesus lived, he went through all that for love. He went through all that because he had one desire, and that was relationship with you. He's so lovesick that he couldn't stand being in eternity without you. He had to break from his side the sun and come in the nature of a man so that he could redeem us and buy us back. It was all for love that Jesus came and he lived here on the earth. And when you realize, it doesn't matter who hates me, it doesn't matter what they say about me, it doesn't matter who turns their back and walks out because as long as Jesus walks in, that's all that matters in my life is that Jesus loves me. John chapter 15, turn there with me. John chapter 15, we're going to read verse number 18 through verse number 20. Earlier in this discourse, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he tells them, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. In John chapter number 15, starting in verse number 18, Jesus says these words. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Realize that the life of Jesus, Jesus was already hated. Jesus wasn't loved when he was here on the earth. Yes, he had crowds of people around him, but by the time his life was ending here on the earth, all the crowds had gone. He was deserted. Rather than releasing him, they shouted, release to us, Barabbas, crucify him. Verse number 19, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You know what he just said? He just said that when you go through a problem, when you go through trial, when you give your heart and your life to Jesus and all of a sudden people start hating on you, what, you're a Christian? Why would you do something so stupid? Wait, you're giving your money to church? Have you lost your mind? Never had anything to say about your money when you're giving it to drugs or to the bars or to all that other stuff, right? Now all of a sudden they have an opinion about your money. Wait, you, you, don't preach to me. Don't you tell me about Jesus. That's foolish. That's a crutch. See, Jesus is saying, that's not weird. That's normal. Why? Because you're no longer of the world. If you were of the world, the world would love you. You would fit right in. But because you've been born again, because you are made new, now because you've been taken out of the world, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. You are a new creation. And therefore, when the world looks at you, they don't understand you, and they're going to hate you. That's just part of the Christian walk. Look at the next verse. Verse number 20 says, remember the word that I had said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they kept my word, 
they will keep yours also. He's saying, guys, remember something. You've got to remember this. When you are considering life, when you start to grow weary, when you start to faint, you feel like you can't go on any longer on the race. Now what does he say? He says, I want you to remember, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If you're a little battle weary, if you're going through the fight, if you're, you're wondering, why God? Why don't I have any friends? Why did everybody desert me? Why am I here all alone? Why are people saying things about me? Why does my family hate me? Here's the reason why. Because if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And the road that you're following is the road that follows after Jesus. He's the captain. He's the one that went out before. He's already run the race ahead. And now he's beckoning us on saying, come on you can make it. But that road that Jesus walked was a road that was marked with suffering and pain and shame. And yet he despised the shame. He went to the cross for the joy that was set before him and he sat down at the right hand of God. So consider it, remember it, and know that you're on the right track. We got to consider his life, but not only his life. When you're considering him, you got to consider his death. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number three in the message paraphrase says this, when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. See, when you start to get weary, when you start to get discouraged, when you start to think about how bad it is, You know, I I know we can look around, we can take a look at the political system right now and go, man, that's a mess. I don't understand what's going on there. All these people are great. There's not a good choice out there right now. Start to get discouraged. Start to look at the economy. Maybe there's some hope in the economy. Maybe finances will come. Maybe the economists will help us. Maybe they'll say, and you start to look at the economy, there's no hope on the horizon there either. Then you start to say, well, maybe I can pour myself into community. And you start to look around the community and you see community's not going up. No, it's going down. Uh, you say, well, maybe, maybe not there. Maybe I can go to family. Maybe I can. And all of a sudden, you start to look at your family. You go, man, no, they're still crazy. Still, still, still need Jesus, right? And it seems like everything in this world, as you look around, you start to consider your life. You can get discouraged and say, I've got it so bad. I go to the work. I go to job, right? And the boss is on my case. I come home and my spouse is yelling at me about what I did do or what I didn't do. I got the kids that are ignoring me. And it's so bad right now. And yet, when you start to add up the facts, when you start to consider it, go over that story again. If you're feeling down, just start reading the Gospels and start reading towards the end of the Gospels. Go over that story. Remember that Jesus was beaten, that Jesus had his disciples all turn their back on him and run from him in the very hour of his need. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver by one of his own. He was betrayed with a kiss. Oh my goodness, what a traitor. Here he is, he's got trials, of mockings by night, unlawful trials. There he is, he's beating, the, the soldiers are beating him, punching him in the face saying, prophesy, who hit you? Pulling out his beard, spitting on him. And they put a crown of thorns over his head that pierced his brow and the blood streamed out of his face and down his body. They beat him, they whipped him with a flagellum. They had these whips that had the cat of nine tails on it. They had little pieces of bone and fragments at the end of leather. So that whip would wrap around the body and that little bone or that little piece of metal would sink into the flesh so that when they pulled it back, it would tear the flesh off of his body. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that he was marred beyond comprehension. You couldn't even recognize him as a man any longer. You wouldn't have known that was Jesus. There they led him up to Calvary. He had to carry his own cross with the people shouting at him and spitting at him, yelling at him and cursing at him. There he's nailed to a tree, raised up with his arms stretched wide pierced through his hands and his feet, a public spectacle for everyone to see. See, when you start to look at the death of Jesus, you realize, I don't have to go through all that. I don't have to endure that pain. I don't have to endure that suffering. I don't have to endure that trial. I don't have to endure the mocking or the scourging or the cross. See, Jesus did it all for you, and he did it all for me. And when we start to look at that, it starts to encourage our lives In fact, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 in the God's Word translation says this, you struggle against sin, but your struggles haven't killed you. Come on, somebody. Your struggles haven't killed you. I had a friend named Clay who used to go to this church. He's in a wheelchair. Clay was one of the happiest guys I ever knew in my entire life. I love seeing him. I'd be like, hey, Clay, what's up, bro? And he'd be like, hey, pastor, how you doing, man? I said, I'm good. How you doing? He says, oh, you know, every day above ground is a good one. Hello, your struggles haven't killed you. You're still breathing, you're still pumping, you're still going. 
Any, anybody got kids in this place, right? Some of you got your kids next to you, right? You'll remember this. Here you are at the dinner table trying to feed them something healthy after they had all that sugar at grandma's house, right? Here they come over and you say, no, you're going to eat something healthy tonight, kid, right? You put the broccoli, you put, you know, whatever it is, carrots, beans, I don't know, what it, whatever it is in your house that you, you, you're putting something healthy out. And what do they do? They poke at it with their fork like, mm. <laughs> What's that? It's healthy. Eat it. I don't want to eat it. I don't care. I didn't ask you if you want to eat it. You're going to eat it. What do they do? They cut off the little corner, little microscopic piece, and they sniff it. Ugh! Nah, no, nah, I can't do it. I can't do it, Dad. I can't do it. No, you're going to eat it, right? And you threaten them within an inch of their life. You take away every amenity that they have at the house. You, you, you threaten prison and the bread of affliction, right? Yeah, you're just getting bread and water. That's it. That's all you get. That's the only nutrition. Unless you eat that broccoli, you get no nutrition, just bread and water. And they say, well, that'd be better than that. Well, you want to try this? You want to try it, kid, right? And finally... Finally, after you take away dessert, right? No, not the dessert. Here they are, and they're ready to finally eat that little piece of something that they broke off the edge. And what do they do? They put it in there. Ah, like they ate a cyanide tablet, right? Ah, they're writhing at the table, foaming at the mouth. They roll off the chair, right? They're on the floor. Finally, they, 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 they grab onto the, the side of the table, and they pick themselves up, and they sit back down, and they collapse into the chair. Okay, mom. Okay, dad. I did it. And what does every parent say? Okay, kids, you can recite this with me. Did it kill you? It didn't kill you, did it? Eat another bite. The fight starts all over again, right? (laughs) But what is God saying? Look at Jesus. Look at the death that he died. You don't have to go to the cross. Oh, thank God we don't have to go through that. Jesus did it for us. Jesus took the punishment for us. No one's busting down the doors of our church. Listen, people are giving the ultimate sacrifice all over the world. They're hanging pastors up above their pulpits and burning the church down in different parts of the world. They're busting in doors. They're killing people. They're killing babies. They're decapitating people. We don't have to go through any of that. Your struggle against sin has not killed you. You have not resisted to bloodshed. You do not have it so bad, you bunch of big babies. Listen, unless you think I'm speaking down to you, I'm talking to myself too. Okay, we're in this together because there's times where I can get discouraged. Man, I got it so bad, I got it so hard, the weight, the pressure. Listen, I don't have to go to the cross. I don't have to be separated from the presence of the Father as God turned his head from Jesus because he could not look upon sin. What was that like to be separated from God for the first time? Can you imagine the agony? I don't have to go through that. Jesus went through that so that God would never leave me nor forsake me because he was forsaken, now I'm accepted. Because he was died, now I can live. Because he was given his life and the payment on the cross, now it's given to me as a free gift. Oh my goodness, I do not have it so bad. See, our problem is a problem of perspective. We get looking at our problems and they're right here in our face staring at us. There's something yelling at us, but our problem is a problem of perspective. When you start to back up, when you start to look at the life and the death of Jesus, you realize, I don't got problems. Listen, if Jesus can endure the cross, I can endure whatever the situation is that I'm going through. We think we have it so bad until we look at the grueling agony of the cross and the horrible death that he died. We have it nowhere near as bad See, when we consider the death of Jesus, we realize his death means life for each and every one of us. Because he died, we can live. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, the apostle Paul is writing, he's talking about their struggles, talking about what it takes, and talking about how he didn't grow weary and how he didn't faint. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to read verse number 8. Through verse number 10, take a look at it with me. Look at what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 says this. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Verse number 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we always keep this in front of us. We always remember that Jesus went to the cross, that he was beaten and that he died. Look at what he says. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. In other words, that it will appear on the inside of us. See, when you consider the death of Jesus Christ, you realize that we can have his life as well. Which brings us to the last thing to consider today. Not only consider his life, not only consider his death, but consider his resurrection. 
We need to consider the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because Jesus didn't stop at what most of us would call the end. We see death as the ultimate. We see death as that's it, there's no more. We see death as it's done, it's over with. And yet Jesus didn't let the stop be the end. He didn't let death hold him down. He didn't let it hold him back. Yes, there was a moment on the cross that Jesus breathed his last and gave up the ghost and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. And he died there on the cross. His lifeless, motionless body was taken down and laid in the grave. There Saturday all day, nothing was happening. Nothing took place. Nothing was going on. And yet here on the third day, Sunday morning, early in the morning, just as the sun was rising, the sun was rising. The stone was rolled away. And now here comes Jesus, the morning star, the bright and the light that came into the world. Jesus didn't stop at death. He was now alive and is now alive forevermore, seated at the right hand of the Father. See, when you consider that's my Jesus, when you consider the power of the resurrection is the same power that's living on the inside of me. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave now gives me life and gives life to my mortal body. You don't stop at death. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand how bad I got it. They, uh, they already gave me the pink slip. Pastor, you don't know. They already signed the divorce paper. Pastor, you don't understand. My kids have made their choice. They're running with the gangs. They're out there doing drugs. Pastor, you don't realize. You don't recognize. I already got the eviction notice. Pastor, you don't understand all of the stops and the roadblocks. You don't understand the death. There's the, the bank account has a big fat donut in it right now. That's zero. Goose egg. Pastor, you don't understand. Listen, I may not understand your particular situation, but I do understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, I've been around this church long enough and been pastoring here long enough to know that there are people in our church who after the divorce were able to reconcile and get back together with their spouse. I've been around long enough to hear people who said, even though the bank was getting ready to repossess, I don't even know what happened, but money came through and the government program kicked in and something took place and now we own the property free and clear. I don't understand it, Pastor. I've been around long enough to hear parents who had their children lost and gone south now returning to their borders and coming back and serving the Lord greater than they ever had before. I've been around long enough to hear people who had gotten the pink slip and the boss said, it's over, it's done. And then a month later, they got a call back. Hello, who is this? This is your former employer. Listen, we, we realized we made a mistake letting you go. We want to bring you back. And they said, well, it's going to take a lot to bring me back. <laughs> Come on, somebody. They said, what, what do you want? I want an office. Okay. Bigger salary, K. Okay. Company car, K. Okay. What else you got? <laughs> Benny's, K. Okay. And they got it all. Everything they asked for, the hours, the location, the, 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 the title, the position, they got it all back. Why? Because God is a God who raises the dead. God is a God who doesn't stop at the sign, doesn't stop at death, doesn't stop at the block. No, he breaks through it and he raised Jesus from the dead. He can raise your life. Hallelujah. That's good news. See, when we consider his resurrection, we realize we have a future and we have a hope. It's not over until God says it's over. He's the one who has the final say. 2 Timothy chapter 2, turn there with me. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. The Apostle Paul is writing to his young protege, Timothy. Really, the Apostle Paul, these are kind of his last words, the last things that he's delivering because he knows he's about ready to die. He's about ready to resist unto bloodshed. It's going to give his life. There in a Roman prison, the Apostle Paul writes these words, he's bound, he's in chains. 2 Timothy chapter 2, take a look at verse number 8 through verse number 10. Look at the first word, he says, remember. Everybody say, remember. remember. What are we talking about? We're talking about considering him. We need to remember this stuff, because if we don't, when the stops come in our life, when death comes in, we'll say it's over. No, remember. Look at what he says. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. See, he took this so personally. He said, this is my gospel. Not just the gospel. This is my gospel. I remember this. Why? Because this is my gospel. This is what my Lord, my Savior, my Jesus, this is my word from God. And he was raised again. 
from the dead. See, there's other gospels out there. There's other people who have said, oh, Jesus didn't really raise. That was a spirit that came back, you know. His body was still in the grave. Or, no, 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 the disciples, they came and they stole the body. They knocked out all the guards. Listen, you think 12 disciples, those goofballs, do you think that they could take on a legion of Roman soldiers? I don't think so. Yeah, Peter cut off an ear, but it was on, wasn't until Jesus stepped in and said, oh, hold on, Malchus, sorry about that, bro. Let me get that back for you. <laughs> Guys, simmer down. But see, the true gospel is that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. But look at what he says, verse number nine, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. In other words, because of Jesus being raised from the dead, I can go through every problem. I can go through every trial. And he says, even to the point of chains. There were stops in the Apostle Paul's life. Here he is trying to go and minister and people stop him. Here he is trying to go up to this place and now the Holy Spirit says no. Then he's trying to go over here and the devil stops him. Then he's trying to go to this place on a ship. The ship wrecks, right? All of a sudden he's there trying to help people out and create a fire, trying to help out and just be a good guy. Snake bites him. Now all of a sudden he's trying to go over here and he's trying to preach the gospel. The Jews are following him from city to city to city to city, resisting him at every turn. In fact, they create a riot at Ephesus. They get so mad at him in one place that they throw stones at him, they kill him, they drag him out of the city as dead and the disciples surround him and raise him back up. He had a lot of stops in his life and now here he is in chains. He can't travel, he can't preach the gospel, all he can do is write letters and yet look at what he says, for which I am in chains, but the word of God is not chained. Oh come on, you ought to get excited about that. Why? Because it doesn't matter what happens here on the earth. It doesn't matter the stops in life. It doesn't matter if there's death. Even if you die, the word of God is ever living. The word of the Lord endures forever. And even if it doesn't happen in your lifetime, it will happen in his time. Man, I know people who were believing God for their family members to get saved, and people one by one were getting saved over the decades, over the years, and they died, and people were still not saved. But at their funerals, they raised their hand, and they prayed, and they gave their hearts and lives to Jesus. It doesn't stop at death. The word of the Lord will take place. God is watching over it to perform it. Why? Because if he doesn't, then he would be a liar, and he'd have to give up his throne. And yet God says his word is not chained. You need to unleash the power of the word in your life. You need to speak it. You need to declare it. You need to believe it. You need to say it. You need to write it down. And remember the word of God is not chained. Look at the next verse. Verse number 10. Therefore, in other words, because of what I just said about the resurrection, about the word of God not being chained, therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. There's gonna come a day where Jesus comes for us. The eastern sky splits and he'll call us to himself. We may not all die, but we will all be changed to the glory of God. And if what we were believing for didn't happen on this earth, in this life, it will happen in the life to come. God's word is powerful and God's word does not stop at the end. It does not stop at death. It does not stop at a grave. No, his word shall endure and he will perform it and cause it to come to pass. Your job is to remember. Your job is to believe. Your job is to keep going, to not grow weary and to not faint. How do we do that? We consider him. We consider his life. We consider that if the world hated us, it already hated him. And that it doesn't matter who hates us as long as Jesus loves us. What do we remember? We remember his death. We consider the fact that he went through grueling agony and that our struggles against sin, they haven't killed us. We're still pumping, we're still breathing, we've still got breath in our lungs to tell someone about Jesus. And finally, we consider his resurrection. Doesn't matter what stops happen in your life, the power of Jesus Christ, that resurrection power is now living on the inside of us. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated for a second. Don't get up. Don't leave. We've got a couple of people in the leave early sections that are going to service you at the tables, volunteers, that sort of a thing. But everybody else, sit down. Listen up, because your eternal life's at stake. And I want to make sure that if today was your last day, that if today you died, that you wouldn't go to hell, but that you would go to heaven. Look at me. Look at me. Come on, even you guys that are leaving, I'm talking to you. Listen up. Stay there. I want to make sure you guys don't go to hell. And I love you enough to get in your face right now. Don't leave during this time. Make sure that your heart's right with God before you leave. 
Listen, we've had parents that have disciplined us. We've had people, teachers, that sort of thing. But pastors, you know, it seems like we're just sissies and we can't say anything. Listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth right now. Your eternal life is at stake. And I don't want you to die and go to hell. Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, isn't that convenient? Listen, the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus went to the cross and died so that you didn't have to go to hell. And yet, just by saying you don't believe in it doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to face the reality of it. So doesn't it make sense that we should find out how to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. No, they don't. Any more than all roads lead to the moon. You can drive around the earth as long as you want, and you will never make it to heaven. You will never make it to the moon. Not all roads lead to heaven. There's one way, and Jesus came, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It's God's heaven, we gotta get there God's way. Sometimes people think, well, I'll just be good, and my goodness will get me into heaven. No, you can't do it. Can't be good enough because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not gonna make it to heaven by being good, doing good deeds, getting involved in social justice causes, charities, giving money, helping little old ladies cross the street. Listen, it doesn't work like that. You're not gonna make it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not gonna make it to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, I've attended enough church. My parents raised me in church, told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or sinkers to fur around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. Went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school, maybe catechism class. You've always considered yourself to be a Christian. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your parents raise you in church, tell you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. doesn't matter how much church you attend, how many classes you go to, if you're baptized or Christian, wear religious jewelry. It doesn't matter if you're born in America either. America is not the Christian nation that you have elite status because you're born here. All of a sudden you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And just because you're not some other religion doesn't make it default category. Oh, I guess they're not a Buddhist, not a Muslim, not a Hindu. I guess they get to go to heaven. No, it doesn't work like that. So he said, well, pastor, hold on a second, because I, I, you know, not only was a child that I go to church, here I'm sitting in church right now, sitting in front of you. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian because I'm in church. Well, I'm glad that you're here today. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian? That's like me saying, you know what I really want to be? A Dodger. I want to play Dodger baseball. And so I decide I'm going to go buy a Dodger uniform, bring my bat and my ball, drive down to Los Angeles, sit in the dugout, call myself a Dodger and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. Listen, they're going to find me sitting there about game time. Say, you're not supposed to be here. They're going to drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a member of the Dodgers organization. Can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian. Some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, okay, I understand that, but I know who God is. I, I know about Jesus and you know, believe that Jesus Christ is a God. I, I believe in the resurrection. All that stuff you talk about is life, his death, his resurrection. I, I know about all that stuff. Sing the songs at Christmas. Celebrate Easter every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you. I got involved in my church. Helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor Bible, made decisions. People thought of me as a leader. And while that's great, I'm glad you did those things. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that that will get you in heaven. Knowing who God is. It doesn't work like that. No one in the Bible says you can know enough about God and that magical knowledge will all of a sudden just elevate you into the presence of God. It doesn't work. In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and that doesn't qualify him for heaven. Listen, you could sing, you could dance, you could teach, you could preach. You could do all that stuff, and yet Jesus said there were people that did miracles, signs and wonders, prophesied in his name, and yet he still says to them, away from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. What a terrible thing to hear on our way into eternity, because we would be expelled from the presence of God, cast out. And that's why this is so serious, and that's why I love you enough to get in your face today and tell you the truth. If you think that you're going to get to heaven any other way than God's way, you're not going to make it. Well, what is God's way? Jesus came and he said these words. He said, you must be born again. There's no other way you're going to get to heaven except that you must be born again. Now, I know Hollywood movies, television, books, and the internet, they made it out to be some weirdo, crazy Christianity. But listen, let's not let them define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible do that for us, shall we? What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Gross, graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance 
God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to let you know exactly what we're going to do so that you don't think we're trying to trick anybody. Okay? I want to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart and be born again. If you want to be included in that prayer, listen up because you know you need to give God all your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. You know that if today was your last day on the earth that you wouldn't make it to heaven but that you would go to hell. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to bow our heads and close our eyes. As you do that, I'm going to ask you to consider your life. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? As you answer that question in your heart, no, 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 the answer, but you and God. I want you to examine your answer because some of you might say, well, I think I'd go to heaven. Maybe I'd go to heaven. I, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I've never done this before. Never, never given my heart and life to Jesus. If you answered any of those ways, then you need to get your hand up. Maybe you've been playing games in church. At one time you were on fire for the Lord, but you know that you've sunk back, you backslidden, doing things you never thought you'd do in places you never thought you'd be, and you're lukewarm now. Play in church, and you know you need to repent and get right. Today is your day of salvation. As I ask you that question, you consider where you're at. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three, just like this. Bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Okay? Now, remember, everybody's heads are going to be bowed. Everybody's eyes are going to be closed. So if you thought, maybe I'll be embarrassed if that happens. Listen, I'm the only one that's going to see. I'll see your hand go up. I'll connect with you. You can look me in the eyes. Give me a little wave if I don't see you, that sort of a thing. And then once I acknowledge you, you can put your hand right back down. It's that simple. It's that easy. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. Today, your call. Today, your choice. Make the right decision today. Giving God all of your heart and all of your life. Being headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Who should raise your hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise your hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this before? Said yes to Jesus. Giving him all of your heart and all of your life. I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? Get ready to get your hand up and you can be included in this prayer that we're about to pray. Let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes at this time. I want to thank everybody for staying put. Thank you guys at this time. And I want to ask you that question one more time. Where would you be if this was your last day on the earth? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just consider that right now in the stillness and in this private moment with God. Where would you be? Now you know that you need to get right with God in this place. You know who you are. You can identify by how you answer that question. You said, I think, hope, maybe, I don't know. Get ready to get your hand up. You said, ah, oh, man, I really am lukewarm. I need to get right. Get ready to get your hand up. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. Right now, you can get ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the families, those of you that are out there in the foyer, those of you that are headed out, thank you for staying, guys. I appreciate you guys staying. Get ready to get your hand up. On mine, wherever you're at, God's watching, God sees. Get ready to get your hand up, and then we're going to pray together. You want to be included in that prayer, get ready to get your hand up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. I need to give God all your heart. I need to give God all of your life. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Got you right there. Nine. Got you over here. Ten. Thank you. Who else today? There's ten. There's eleven. Thank you. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Thank you. Who else today? Anybody else real quick? If I saw you and you know I connected with you, you can put your hand down. But if you're saying, I don't know, I don't know. I got you up there, my man. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Thank you up there. Thank you, number 15. Number 16 up there. I got you over there. Number 17 right there. Thank you. God bless you. I got you right there. Thank you. In front of the family, we've got you right here in the green. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Anybody else? I didn't embarrass them. And I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? You know you need to give God all of your heart. No, you need to give God all of your life. I want to pray that prayer with you today. You want to be included in that prayer, just get it up high for me. If that's you right now. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Thank you. I got you right there. Yes. God bless you. Who else today? Up there. Thank you. God bless you. Got you right there. In the family rooms, is there somebody? Is somebody? All right. Got you over there in the family rooms. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? Who else today? Man, I'm not going to kill you. This is going to bring life. Just like we talked about. Anybody else real quick? Be also real quick, raise it up high. This is the last call, and then we're going to pray together. You want to be included in that prayer. This is your last chance. Come on, don't miss this opportunity. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Got you right there. Yes. Yes. God bless you. Thank you right here. Yes. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. Anybody else? Thank you. Yes. Got gotcha you over there. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God's just tugging at your heart. If you need to do this, I, I know I keep saying this last call, but you guys keep raising your hands. 
So I'm going to fish a little longer. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Yes, got you over there. Yeah, I already got you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise. I would say there's probably like 20 of you out there. Hallelujah. All right, just like I promised, we're going to pray together. Get a hold of your cold purse, sweater, Bible, a friend of you need a friend. If you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. We're going to change destinies today. If you were out there in the foyer and you raised your hand, come on down right now. Come on, let's all stand and welcome them. If you're in the family rooms, bring your children right now. Ask them if they raised their hand and you can bring them into the church service right now. Come on, come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Hallelujah. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. All the way from the top of you, raise your hand. Come on down. Wherever you're at, come on. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Anybody else, if you need to come, just come on down right now. Come on down right now. Come on, they're still coming. Come on, you can come too. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front, came to give God all your heart, came to give God all of your life. Going to be born again, headed for heaven. I'm going to lead you in that prayer just like we talked about. Now listen, I'm going to say simple phrases, short phrases. It's a prayer that you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now listen, this is not about the words of your mouth. So if you mess up on a couple words, that's okay, okay? Really, this is about your heart. Going before the Lord, you're going to be born again, brand new on the inside, okay? I don't know how God does that. It's a miracle, really. He's going to take that dead man that was dead in sin and now he's going to make you alive and give you a new life with him okay so let's all bow our heads let's close our eyes everybody's going to join in together with us i want you to say these words out loud if you have the ability say father god i come to you now in jesus name i give you all of my heart and all of my life i believe that jesus christ is the son of god that he came that he died and he was raised again to life just for me Forgive me my sin. Wash me with your blood. Make me clean. And give me a brand new start with a brand new heart. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Woo! So good. All right, everybody up front, I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right, your left, see this guy in the cool jacket? This is Pastor Joel, really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? He wants to give you some free information, some free literature, take home, read about what to do next in your walk with God, okay? And then he wants to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. It's easy, it's free, listen to it, you need to do it, okay? And then he'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. Just take a couple minutes of your time, and then they'll let you come right back out. So if you guys just make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Woo!